It is Malaysia's lost world. Our distant ancestors first came here to this lush valley almost two million years ago. And over eons of time, they kept on coming to live in this little paradise, tucked away in the limestone peaks of Pera. They sheltered in its numerous caves and drank from its rivers. They exploited its bedrock to make stone tools, refining their skills generation after generation. It was here at one of the crossroads of the ancient world that archaeologists found our most celebrated Southeast Asian ancestor. They call him Perup Man. His bones take us on a journey back into a distant past. This is the Lengong Valley, one of the world's most important archaeological sites. Today, life in Lengong Valley centers around the town of Lengong, almost 300 kilometers north of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia's capital. It is a gateway that leads us back into the ancient past. Lengong Valley is a World Heritage Site. Some of the world's most exciting archaeological finds have been made right here. There are two main archaeological sites at Lengong referred to simply as Cluster 1 and 2. Cluster 1 comprises the very rare open-air sites of Kota Tampan and Bukit Buno. In 1987, Professor Datu Zuraina Majid was excavating a site at Kota Tampan, and what she unearthed that day opened a window into the lives of our ancient ancestors, an undisturbed Stone Age workshop. We opened up a few trenches there and I was very surprised that it was an undisturbed site. Now an undisturbed site is like a um, jackpot because it's going to tell you the story, you'll be able to piece together the story. And to get an undisturbed Paleolithic site is rare. The Paleolithic period is also known as the Stone Age where stone tool technologies were the foundation of this ancient culture. During Paleolithic times, the culture revolved around stone as the raw material. And the technology for stone tool was the basis of uh, their culture. For archaeologists, a discovery like this may come just once in a lifetime. Kota Tampan has revealed many insights into the minds of these ancient tool makers about their choice and understanding of materials and their techniques. We cannot um, just look at tool morphology, but we have to consider what went on in their minds when they were making the stone tools, how much they knew about what they were doing. They were really pretty advanced. They knew exactly what type of raw material would make sharp stone tools and they used the best that was around that would give them the sharpest edge and they also flaked it in such a way that they could use it for the tropics. So that really showed that they were aware of the lithology of stone. They knew their geology. It was as if they had taken Geology 101, you know. Of all the stone types available, they had chosen the best. The archaeologists discovered numerous clusters of stone tools. It looked as if groups of tool makers had once been working the raw stone in a systematic way. This was once a Stone Age production line. From clues at the site, Professor Datuk Zuraina's team discovered that long ago, Kota Tampan was a lake environment, a fertile area well suited to human activity. Uh, many thousand years ago, a lake existed in the Kota Tampan area, and that, that lake was created by a natural landslide. Many people lived around that lake. You have water, you have protection on one side, you have your fish and that kind of thing. It's, it's not a peculiar situation. Everywhere else but you have a lake, you are bound to find old settlements. 
The archaeologists had a fascinating glimpse into the world of Stone Age Kota Tampan. But they were still in the dark about how long ago these tool makers had been at work and why the workshop had been abandoned. Then Professor Datu Zuraina made a breakthrough discovery that would eventually reveal the whole story of Kota Tampan. I saw a speck of grey in this terracotta earth. So I thought, maybe it's the toba ash. So I said, let me take a sample. Sure enough, that was a toba ash. And we found that that ash was found all around the floor of this stone tool workshop. That was really another moment of excitement because that meant we would not only know the date, but we would also know the cause of abandonment of the site. The ash Professor Datu Zuraina had found was a kind of time signature. The ash originated from the eruption of Mount Toba in Sumatra. Scientists have dated this event, the most violent volcanic catastrophe in the last two million years, to about 74,000 years ago. Mount Toba literally exploded, hurling a massive cloud of ash 80 kilometers high and extending as far away as India. It turned day into night. Kota Tampan is just 250 kilometers from Mount Toba. So the eruption would have devastated the world of the tool makers here, forcing them to leave behind their workshop and tools. Professor Datu Zuraina's discovery sent shock waves across the scientific world. More than 30 archaeologists from around the globe descended upon Kota Tampan to see for themselves the startling evidence of such an ancient Paleolithic site in its original context. One of the scientists fascinated by Datu Zuraina's discovery was human geneticist Stephen Oppenheimer, an expert on human migration. Kota Tampan is one of those places where there are stone tools found and they're in a very specific context. When I mean context, that means the surrounding material. And in the case of Kota Tampan, the surrounding material was the ash of the Toba volcano. Datuk Zoraina has found stone tools in that region uh, which are associated with the uh, ash and the dating of the ash is 74,000 and the dating of the tools has also been done by independent means recently, uh, which agrees in general with that 74,000 date. Now this means if those stone tools were made by modern humans, then modern humans were present in Southeast Asia before 74,000 years ago. Scientists believe that modern humans evolved in Africa and then embarked on a global journey across Asia and into the Malay Archipelago and beyond. The dates for the tool-making workshops at Kota Tampan had played a crucial part in the understanding of human migration. All over Lingong Valley, Malaysian archaeologists are unearthing evidence of ancient lifestyles. Another dramatic discovery was made at Bukit Buno where Dr. Mokta Saidin discovered a Stone Age hand axe embedded in a boulder made of a very rare kind of rock called suvite. Pada penghujung 2009, kita temui alat batu di dalam batuan suvite. Suvite ialah batuan metamorph yang terbentuk akibat jatuhan meteorit di sebuah sebuah kawasan yang menyebabkan batuan asal di kawasan berkenaan lebur membentuk batuan baru. Rocks like this can be dated and they determined that the hand axe itself had been made at a later date. The results astonished archaeologists. Selepas kita hantar pentarihan, dia memberikan tarikh 1.83 juta tahun. Ini menunjukkan telah ada satu kelompok manusia awal sebelum 1.83 juta tahun yang merupakan tarikh impact meteorite. This remarkable time span makes the Lingong Valley one of the most significant Paleolithic sites in the world. Discoveries equally as dramatic have been made at Cluster 2, which comprises the Bukit Jawa open-air site and two limestone massifs, 
Bukit Kepala Gajah and Bukit Gua Harimau. Bukit Jawa has evidence of in-situ open-air workshops and stone tools that date back to 200,000 to 100,000 years ago. Plenty of stone tools have now been discovered in the Lengong Valley, but for a long time archaeologists found no trace of the ancient people that made them. The problem for Malaysian archaeologists is that the tropical climate and acid soils usually destroy organic materials, making the discovery of human remains very rare. But the team did not give up. They concentrated their efforts on the Bukit Kepala Gajah Massif, a cast limestone outcrop riddled with more than 20 caves. For our ancient ancestors, Caves were refuges. Was this the place to start looking for human remains? One cave in particular caught Professor Datuk Zuraina's attention. It is called Gunung Runto. It is 150 meters above sea level with the luxury of three entrances. The cave is a natural home for early man. It's got its walls, floor, ceiling, and sometimes more than one entrance. In this particular case, it also is air-conditioned. It's rather cool and comfortable, dry and with sufficient light for them to live. In 1990, Professor Dato Zuraina decided to excavate the site. When we get to a cave, we do not know exactly where to excavate until we have searched for surface finds. That is an indicator of um, habitation. Slowly, meticulously, the archaeologists began investigating this intriguing new site. And in May 1990, they found at last what they had been searching for, for so long a fully intact human skeleton. We were fortunate that we found a skeleton here and it's always exciting when you get skeletons because a skeleton holds a lot of secrets to life at that time. The bones were fragile, brittle and broken. They had to be handled with care. Professor Datu Zuraina realized at once that this was a groundbreaking find. So as the bones were tenderly removed one by one, the position of every other artifact was precisely recorded. You know, when you see a skeleton, you really don't know how significant it's going to be until you study it. And the more you study it, uh, the more details you get and you get stronger evidence and then when you get the total picture, then that's the exciting moment. That's um, Eureka. Professor Datu Zuraina assembled an international team to analyze the find and unravel its mysteries. The lead paleontologist was the renowned Indonesian professor Teku Yaakob. Bones and teeth. Uh, tell a lot of story about themselves that if we can understand the language of the bones then uh, there are many things they can tell you. One thing the bones told Professor Jacob was that this enigmatic individual was a male. So he got a name, Perak Man, after the Malaysian state where his remains had been found. As Jakob continued his analysis, he realized that the bones had a powerful human story to tell. And I saw uh, the hand bones. It's something uh, uh, unusual because you have a very short uh, middle phalanx, especially on the left side, you see. As an expert anatomist, 
Jakob understood immediately what these clues implied. So this anomaly is called uh, brachy mesophalangia. This anomaly is rather rare, uh, even in uh, living population. And then in archaeological material, I have never seen one reported. Brachy mesophalangia is an inherited genetic disorder that causes fingers and limbs to develop differently. Not only is the disease very rare in modern people, evidence of it has never before been found in bones this old. The left arms and the left leg are shorter than the right ones, so uh, his gait is a uh, little different because of the leg bones are not equal. The discovery that Perak man suffered from this rare disease adds significantly to our knowledge of medical history. Jakob made another startling discovery. Perak man had a distinctly curved spine, which could have been caused by his gait, but also suggested he might also have been afflicted with cerebral palsy. Perak man was a challenged individual, but his bones tell us that despite his disabilities, he lived till a ripe old age, between 40 to 45 years old, almost twice the average lifespan then. What could explain this man's long life? According to Jakob, the most convincing explanation is that the Perak man was well cared for by his community. He might even have been revered as a special individual. The evidence for this is by the way he was buried. He was carefully placed in his grave in a kind of fetal position. He was provided with offerings for the afterlife comprising various stone tools and five different types of meat, including shellfish. This strongly implied that Perak man was highly valued in life and communally mourned in death. He's treated uh, well, in a special uh, uh, method of uh, burial. That means he has a, a social uh, position uh, at a higher level you see, because otherwise you get a common burial for the common people. And then uh, it's only one uh, burial in that cave, so he must be uh, somebody special. The discovery of Perak Man's last resting place reveals for the first time in Southeast Asia the funeral rites of one of our Paleolithic ancestors. Perak man had been special then, and he is special today. Now we even know how and why he died, thanks to the work by Professor Abdul Rani Samsudin, who specializes in the study of the anatomy of the human face and jaw. When we uh, took the bones through the CT scan, accidentally we found that there is a cyst, and the cyst is a bone cyst in the right side of the mandible. Right? It's a big cyst, and um, we determined that it is a cyst because it has resolved the roots of the teeth. The roots of the teeth has been damaged. And uh, that cyst could be infected, and that could cause spread of infection throughout the body. I believe that he must have suffered, and that might have been uh, his most probable cause of death. So we now know a great deal about the life and death of Perak Man. But when did Perak Man live? The results of carbon dating tests were as remarkable as anything else in this archaeological drama. The results showed that Perak Man was ceremonially buried in the Lengong Valley more than 10,000 years ago, making these human remains one of the most important discoveries in Southeast Asian archaeology. Within the Lengong Valley are other important cave sites, including the Bukit Gua Harimau Massif in Cluster 2. The Gua Harimau Cave is a prehistoric cemetery where 13 skeletons have been excavated over the years. They date between 4,900 and 1,700 years ago, from the late Neolithic to the early Metal Period. 
A variety of burial items have been found, including earthenware vessels, stone tools, ornaments, and bronzeware. The bronzeware finds at Gua Harimau represent the earliest bronze finds in the Malay Peninsula. For more than 25 years, Professor Datuk Zuraina Majid and her team have worked tirelessly on the many different sites in the Lenggong Valley, revealing a human story spanning close to two million years. It is the longest cultural sequence in one locality outside Africa. The discoveries made here have uncovered a wealth of information about the Paleolithic, Neolithic and Metal Ages in Southeast Asia. For archaeologists the world over, the Lenggong Valley has become an important reference site for Paleolithic stone tool technology. Here we witness evidence of the terrible power of nature, the Toba eruption, which allowed archaeologists to decipher the cause and dates of abandonment of the stone tool workshop of Kota Tampan. The open-air site of Bukit Buno records the earliest hominid presence thus far known in Southeast Asia at 1.83 million years ago with the discovery of hand axes embedded in a rock that resulted from a meteorite impact. It was here in Lenggong Valley that our ancestors buried a special individual whose remains speak to us today of his life and death in the Stone Age. Research in the Lenggong Valley began in the 1980s and it has been uh, continuous and in-depth with very major uh, discoveries that has given us an understanding not just of our own prehistory but of the prehistory of the region and contributed towards an understanding of early man in the world. In 2009, the Commissioner of Heritage, Professor Datu Uzuraina, decided to nominate Lengong Valley as a World Heritage Site. It is not easy to nominate a site to be on the UNESCO World Heritage List. It is a very tedious process, it's a very long process, and not an easy process. We have to have strong justifications for its world significance. Now that's very key. And uh, we have to write a dossier, which is like writing a PhD thesis. And then we have to be evaluated, and maybe many years to receive the um, World Heritage uh, inscription. The people of Lenggong Valley were very excited about the UNESCO submission and held special prayers so that their valley would be nominated. On 30th June 2012, the Lenggong Valley was inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site during the World Heritage Committee meeting in St. Petersburg in Russia. The UNESCO listing is testimony to the achievements of Malaysian archaeologists and scientists who have brought to light the remarkable cultural treasures of the Lenggong Valley. With recognition comes responsibility to make sure that the site meets global standards for the protection and preservation of its heritage. If we look at other heritage sites in the world, it's um, a tourist attraction and uh, the number of tourists will definitely increase. There's a lot for the people to benefit too because the place will have to support the tourists that will visit the site and uh, most of all, the place will be protected for us and for mankind. The many groundbreaking discoveries made in the Lenggong Valley make it one of the world's most important archaeological sites. The Lenggong Valley is important not just to us, but to the rest of the world. The Lenggong Valley, a UNESCO World Heritage Site.